Hallelujah. All right. We bless God. We'll continue to bless His holy name for His gorgeous. We thank God for another Friday in His presence. I always say that each time we gather is a time that we can learn some truths to know how we can conduct our lives in this world so we can represent Him well. Life is all about Romans 8 and 29. He wants us to be conformed to the image of His dear Son. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 29. I know people quote the other verses, but it says for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And the word conformed there is important. I've been talking about eternal life, and I want to connect that. Hallelujah. We welcome viewers uh, all over the globe. And um, keep doing it, keep watching, and keep sharing. The truth must be shared. It must be proclaimed. So keep doing that. Hallelujah. And then this message will be available uh, on YouTube after this live uh, stream. So, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. He chose us because there's a reason, there's a purpose. He has an intent why he chose us so that we will be brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. We'll be like him. Hallelujah. Amen. Become like his son. And I want to dwell on that. Conform to the image of his son, original intent. In the beginning, the Bible says, God said, let us make man in our own image. Genesis 1, 20 says, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. That hasn't changed. Man blew it when he was tempted by the devil and he fell flat on his back. But God hasn't changed. So he devised a way that was the coming of Jesus Christ. He took the form of his burden that he would rescue us. So he took the form of a servant. He became human to be able to deliver us. And I think that is important. So we are going to go to that. Let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter. I, I wasn't planning to go that route, but because of what I'm saying, let's go there. Hebrews chapter 2. Hallelujah. And then um, I'm looking for the verse. You have made him a little, you put up the note. That's all I'm looking at. 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things. 10. Verse 10. Hallelujah. Have you seen it? Yeah. So let's read. And we are going to the 14th, the climax of what I'm reading. For, well, where was I reading? 10. Okay, 10. Sorry. For it was feeling for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Talking about Jesus Christ. For both he who sanctifies and those who are, sanct are being sanctified are, are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. I want to say something here. Because religiously, should I say religiously, traditionally, on or on scriptural traditional lines, we, we say things like, oh, we are joined to us with Jesus. Oh, we are in union with Jesus. Oh, we are one with Jesus. God indwells us. We know the Holy Spirit is in us. But we don't see it the way we should see it. Because if God is in us, it's a show in our conduct. It's a show in our daily interaction with people. But we are not seeing that. 
And then we also see how at times the people of God, children of God, who are one with Christ, we see the way we talk, which is not a good representation of the Father. And normally it exposes uh, us to this extent that we are ignorant of some spiritual truth. Hallelujah. We are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. We are of the same family. Amen. Amen. We are of the same family, the same spirit that dwelt in Jesus, the spirit of God that raised him when he was uh, put in the tomb, that same spirit indwells us. Amen. I can say that enough. Amen. That same spirit. Amen. Now, that same spirit is not limited to us because now it, he indwells us. Whatever the spirit of God did through Jesus Christ, the same can be done Amen. through us, Amen. his body. In the believer. So we see the life of let's 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 look at this. You know, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit uh, filled the disciples, they were baptized. And we saw that after that, somebody like Peter, who was a coward at that time or was acting cowardly, denounced and renounced Jesus, denied him, running for his life. We see this same person going to the house where Dorcas was dead. And then say, Dorcas, arise. Mm -hmm. The same spirit that was upon Jesus was in him. And by the same spirit, he was able to command Dorcas to come from the grave. Hallelujah, to live again. The same spirit. Mm -hmm. We also see the same spirit in dwelling Jesus. Um, Peter, his shadow was healing even the sick. His shadow. What happened? Peter became aware of what he was carrying. He became aware of whose he was. He became aware of his union with the Lord. Jesus said it over and over. I and the Father, we are one. I and the Father are one. And whenever he said that, the people wanted to take, pick up some rocks, stones, and then stone him. You see, he knew that. He walked in that awareness. Awareness, awareness, awareness. Awareness, 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 awareness of that truth is key. Amen. Knowledge itself, without application, is not helpful. I want to say that again. Knowledge by itself, without application of it, is never helpful. So awareness of who we are, whose we are, how we are in union with the Lord, and we walking in that awareness will make all the change that you know can be done. Twelve saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praises to you. Thirteen, again I'll put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Fourteen. Listen to this. In as much in as much, in as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had power, who had the power over of death. That is the devil. Hallelujah. He took upon him. Or he became flesh, like the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh. He became flesh. And I'm laying emphasis on this. The Greek word, which is sars. S-A-R-X, sars. The word became flesh. When we use the word flesh, it can mean your skin, your body. You know, the body of a human being. It can mean animal kind of body. It can also mean, uh, what is it? Human life. Like Jesus, he became flesh. Human life. Do you get it? Human life. Okay. Why am I laying emphasis on this? I want us to know that as he walked on this earth, flesh and blood, but there was something in him that was divine. Eternal life 
was in him. Amen. Eternal life was in him. I'm going to say that again. Eternal life was in him. The life of God was in him. That is why he couldn't stay in the grave. Because life doesn't die. And it's given us the same. We have this same life with that same spirit. Amen. Amen. I want us to be so much aware of that it is the same spirit that we have. No different. Amen. Look at uh, 15. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Fear makes you subject to bondage. Fear cripples potential. Fear cripples potential. Look at this. Fear of death. But when you know that you have life and you are not going to die because when this what we call the altar when it perishes Jesus is going to raise his body up again and he's going to give us what a glorified body. Amen. Hallelujah. So you shouldn't be afraid. So this is not. I just wanted to prove to you that Jesus was not all that. Like some, he was God. He was God. Yes, it's true. He was God. He was God and yet he was human. Do you get the picture? Why am I saying that? Because the life that he lived, the way he conducted himself, was an example, and is still an example for every child of God, that even though you have flesh and blood, and it seems you can be limited in the natural, with him on your inside, with him indwelling you by his spirit, you are not that limited like you think. Amen. Thank you for that, amen. I want to say that again. You are not that limited like you think. I'll say that again. You are not that limited like you think. Why? Because Jesus was not limited. Why was he not limited? Because he had the spirit of God. The divinity was at work with him. Now, Jesus never referred to something that we, we normally do. We say, you know, I'm human. You know, I'm human. We are human. My nature, you know, my nature and nature. And when we refer to our nature, we're always referring to our fallen nature, the sinful nature. But if you are born again, you don't have that fallen nature. Amen. You have the nature of Christ. Amen. The nature of God. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. The seed of Christ. Amen. That is so sinful. That is full of righteousness. That's right. That is the life of God. That's right. So now, that takes us to uh, Romans chapter 6, 23. It says, for the wages of sin, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. But... The gift of God. Now I want us to understand this and get it. This is fundamental, but people wrestle with that. They struggle. The gift of God is the gift of God. Who here has ever worked for a gift? You go to someone and they tell the person, I want you to give me a gift. You know what? Therefore, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. So at the end of it, they give me a gift. Is that a gift? No. No, that's work. You work to earn it. Hallelujah. A gift is like something, a pie, that falls from the sky. Amen. Unexpected. Yes. You know, the person didn't tell you that I'm going to do this. And then all of a sudden, for no work that you have done, the person chooses to give to you. Period. That's a gift. When a gift is given, we, we do this. We receive or we reject it. In the same way, Jesus Christ was that gift. That the Father gave. He's given to everyone. But not everyone has received that gift. The gift of God is Jesus Christ. Yeah. That gift is eternal life. Yeah. Now, I'm going to break this down 
So nobody's ever going to be confused about this. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The gift of God is eternal life. That gift from God is eternal life. And that eternal life is in Christ Jesus. Why? Because he is life. In the beginning was the word. So now let's go down to John chapter 1. We'll read from verse 1. For those who haven't seen before, they haven't heard before to hear. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. So it looks like we are talking about word. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, this word was with God, and the word is God himself. All right? So that's why we say God and his word are inseparable. That's right. Let's continue. Verse 2. He was in the beginning. Now you see the pronoun, third person pronoun. He. So when we read he, we can say what? The word. All right? He. And we are going to know that he was talking about Jesus Christ. He, the word, we read Genesis 1.26. God said, let us make God, Elohim, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Said. So we say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So he, God, he, Jesus, he, the word, he, the Savior, was in the beginning with God. Let's read on. All things were made through him, Jesus, or him, the word. I'm going to read that again. All things were made through him, the word, or him, Jesus Christ. And without him, the word, without him, Jesus Christ, nothing was made that was made. Amen. Do you get the picture? Let's read on. This one seals it. In him, the word. In him, Jesus Christ, was life. And we read in Romans 6, 23, the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Where do we find this life? That life is in Jesus. In him was life because he is life. And the life was the life of man. This is the reason why in the days that Jesus lived, people had to accept Jesus. Physically, naturally, they had to accept him because he was a word in manifestation, in demonstration, in reality. Do you get it? Now he's not here. But guess what? The word is still here. So we became born again or we became engrafted into the family of God by we hearing the word the news, the gospel of salvation. Amen. And we believed. Amen. And we're born from above. The Bible says we've been born by an incorruptible seed. Right. Incorruptible. Which is the word of God. Amen. And our birth is not due to the impulse of any man. It's not from human origin, sperm, natural. But it's from a spiritual world, sperm, Word Amen. of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We are going to go there. I'm going ahead of my time and myself. Now look at uh, look at this. In Him was life, and the life was what the light of man. Light of man. Amen. In Him was life. In John 14, don't go down. Just say in John 14 because we haven't finished with this. In John 14, 6 says, "I am, I am what the way, the truth." In him was the life. That's why you could say, if you eat this bread, I'm talking about the bread of life. If you eat this bread and you drink my blood, you have everlasting life. And you are going to find out because he's the one authorized by the Father to give life. So John, at uh, this same chapter, verse 14, the word became flesh. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. 
You see, we come back to the word flesh again. Flesh. God wants us to be conformed to the image of His Son, Jesus. So the way Jesus walked on this earth, if somebody tells you it is impossible, we, we are human, and we can't walk like that. You see, He was God. That's a lie. Because if we can live like Jesus Christ, He would not tell us, I'm going to shift gears, take you somewhere now. We'll come back here. We haven't finished. But go to John. I want to prove this point and I'll come back. John 13, 34. If it is so, then he wouldn't tell us that love your enemies or love your neighbor as yourself. He wouldn't tell you when your enemy is hungry, feed him. Because if it's God and he's the only one who can do that and humans cannot do it or nobody can do it, then why would he tell us to do it? If he says we should do it, that means we are wired. He's giving us what it takes, the ability to be able to do it. And it was the divinity in Jesus that made him able or that enabled him, that empowered him to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. The people he was going to die for, they were trying to kill him, but yet in love, he persisted. It takes what? Divinity. He was full of grace, we read, and truth. Grace enables you to do what the human, what do you call it, ability cannot do. Hallelujah. Amen. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. What's the new commandment? Love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. That means we can do it. That's what it is. That's simple. If we cannot do it, he would say what? Do it. So if Jesus was able to do it, that reminds me of Stephen. When he was being stoned in Acts chapter 7, he did what Jesus did. He said, Father, don't lay this to the account. Don't charge them with this sinful thing they are doing. Jesus on the cross forgave Stephen. He also did. Hallelujah. Amen. Then he goes on 35. By, by loving one another by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love, if you have love one for another. So this tells me, we suddenly say, oh, what did Jesus did? Oh, we can't do it. Blah, blah, blah. That's a lie. He loved. And he's saying you can love. So you to go about doing what? This love business. Why? Because the same spirit that dwelled in him, the same spirit is in us too. The same God who was his father is the same God who is our father. Amen. The same God that sent him on this earth for a purpose is the same God who has sent us here also for the same purpose, to love people. Amen. To reconcile them through Christ to our God. Amen. It hasn't changed. It takes divinity. Remember, we read in Hebrews chapter 2 that he because of the children, he also took what? The form of uh, flesh and blood. So he could rescue them. Don't let anybody lie to you. I've talked to you about Peter already. Peter, Jesus raised the dead. Peter raised up Dorcas in the book of Acts. He shadowed you people. So if somebody is saying, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. Okay. Peter, without the empowerment, denied Jesus. He said, this guy, I don't even know him. But when he received the Holy Spirit, Amen. he could get to the cripple and say, well, I know what I have. Watch that. Ask, uh, ask three. I know I don't have silver now. I don't have gold to give to you. But I know what I carry. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Walk. And the man walked. He was aware of it. Hallelujah. Amen. The same thing. But proud to that. Somebody brought their son to them to help, and they couldn't help. You see, they were not aware of what they were carrying. If we don't study the word, and we don't embrace truth, and ministers of God, spiritual leaders, fail to teach truth the way it is, then 
We are going to be powerless Christians. Powerless. Afraid of everything and anything. Now let's go to uh, the John chapter 1 that we're reading. Jesus himself said in John 14, 12, he says, if you believe what? In me, you do the works that I do. And you do what? Greater works. He said it. Hallelujah. Amen. So where John, we read, uh, let's go to verse uh, 11. John 1, 11. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. To those who believe what? To those who believe in his name. Mm -hmm. All right? Let's read on. Who were born? Who were born? Not of what? Blood. Blood. Mm -hmm. Nor of the will of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Nor of the will of man. Right. But of God. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference here. Now I want us to understand. Right. Nicodemus asked Jesus, How can a man that is old like me, Nicodemus, how can I enter into my mother's womb again and be born the second time? He wasn't talking about natural birth. He was talking about spiritual birth. He was talking about divine birth. Jesus was born in the divine way because the Spirit of God, in Luke chapter 1, the Bible said, um, he told, uh, the angel told Gabriel, told Mary, that the Spirit of the, the power of the highest will overshadow you. And then you will conceive. So there was no natural or flesh. Is what I'm saying when I said flesh, referring to human. Mm -hmm. So there was no flesh seed, no flesh sperm, mm -hmm. but it was divine. Mm -hmm. The word of God is sperm, is seed. Mm -hmm. In Galatians 3 16, Jesus Christ is the seed. The word of God is seed. That's why 1 Peter 1 23 says, We are born of the incorruptible seed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's read this in the uh, Amplified Version. It breaks it down. We are born of God. Amen. Okay, when a chicken gives birth, does it, a hen, does it give birth to a, a goat? Okay, so if God is giving birth, his child should be, be what? God. Is he, is he like we are thinking now? We are thinking, God giving birth? God. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Because when a good tool brings forth, it brings forth what? Apple? No. Because every seed, according to God's word, every seed reproduces after what? It's kind. That's it. So when God gives birth, he spoke his word to us. We see his word, which is the seed. We became pregnant with the seed. And we're giving birth. Hallelujah. Who owe their birth neither to blood nor to the will of the flesh, that of physical or impulse, nor to the will of man, that of a natural father, but to God, they are born of God. Amen. Do you get it? Amen. Let's have the message. Amen. We are born of God. These are the God begotten. Not blood begotten. Mm -hmm. Not flesh begotten. No sex begotten. <laughs> Do you get it? Because in the natural, for a human being to show up, there must be sexual intimacy. Mm -hmm. A husband and a wife must come together. But here, he said, this, this birth, mm -hmm. this born again experience that we have, now, it's not natural. That's why we, he refers to it as born from above. From God. God begotten, not blood begotten, not flesh begotten, not sex begotten. Now, let me close my case by reading 1 Peter 1 23. Then I'm going to move on speed. I'm joking. I'm going to move on <laughs> fast. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Having been born again, not a what? Corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives forever. That's the word. Incorruptible, imperishable. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Now let's look at uh, the Amplified Version. You have been regenerated. That is proper translation. Because 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about the fact that if any man be in Christ, that's from 17, he's a new creature. Or new creation. Alright? We are as spirits regenerated. God did some divine, supernatural what? Surgery. Take, took out, as it were, the sinful nature, the Adamic nature. And then he gave us, he blessed us, that gift. He blessed us with himself. The gift of righteousness. Because Romans chapter 5, 17 says that we receive what? The gift of righteousness, the abundance of grace. A gift. So, regenerated, born again, not from what? A mortal, what is that? Origin, seed, sperm, but from one that is what? Immortal, by the ever living and lasting word of God. So, I keep saying this. Well, I know. My parents are now with the Lord. But naturally, God used them to bring me into the world. Naturally. Okay? And then, spiritually, it was Jesus that was used to bring me into the world. Spiritual arena. To become a family with God. Amen. Do you get it? Yeah. Yes. The same way. So, I know of my natural, like Jesus could refer to Mary. What he was saying, uh, oh, this is your mother. Your brothers are here. And blah, 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 blah. He said, who is my brother? Who is my mother? Who is my sister? Those that will know the will of God, yeah. and they do it. That's why it's not a shame to call us brethren, because the same blood and the same spirit affect us. Amen. Do you get it? Yes. Okay. Now, let's go to Romans chapter. No, should I read this? Okay, since we are in, uh, okay, let's let's read. Um, I want to talk about how this life comes about. Okay, let's go to John chapter three, fifteen and sixteen. John chapter three, fifteen and sixteen, is a, a popular scripture. Let's go to the new uh, New King James version. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life, eternal life, is not long life. We're talking about Zoe, the life of God. Amen. If you are born again, you have the life of God. Whoever believes, the Bible says, if you believe, you have. I want to say that again. If you believe, yeah. you have. You don't have to go into a store and buy something. No. You don't have to fast for certain days before. You don't have to pray for certain days before. You only have to what? Believe. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Like we go to some stores and they say, oh, cash only. We don't accept cards. You have the you have debit card. You have money in your account. But they say, oh, well, I'm sorry. We take only cash. So that is the requirement of God. You have to believe. So you don't perish. Let's look at the 16th verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you see it again? When you believe, you have. When you believe, you have. You just don't believe anybody. You have to believe in Jesus Christ. Why Jesus Christ? I'm going to give you the answer. But let's read down 17 before. 17. For God did not send his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to do what? Condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. Amen. And preachers have not been given the ministry of condemnation. Because God himself is not trying to condemn people. And Jesus came not to condemn people. So we are sent to go tell the good news. Amen. How Jesus came not to condemn them. But some preachers are yet to wake up to this message. What they preach is condemnation. You see what is going on? You see how that is serious? God 
His intention is not to condemn. It's not to pass judgment on anybody. He wants everyone to be saved. In fact, we will come back to this. I want to prove this point by reading 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. For God is no slack concerning his promise. Hallelujah. That's the reason. You see, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some count slackness, but his long suffering toward us. Not willing, not willing, not willing, not willing that any should perish. He's not. Someone said Bangla fish. <laughs> He's not a bad daddy. He's not a wicked daddy. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everyone to come to that place of repentance. But it's not going to force everyone to come to that place of what? Repentance. If he forces us to do everything, then he ceases to be a God of love. He's become a big bully. Hallelujah. So let's go back to the verse that we're reading now. John 3, 17. Now I want to zero in on this condemnation thing. Because condemnation is stopping a lot of people from being the person, the people that God intend, intends for them to be. Jesus died for that kind of life. And then that same condemnation stops people from walking, functioning, operating the gifts and the graces, the ability that God has given to them. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. So why do some people think the assignment is to condemn people? If God, the creator himself, is not condemning people. Don't get me wrong. Condemnation and judgment is different. We have to judge righteously. We have to judge what people do and say. If you don't judge according to the word, then how are you going to know this is wrong and this is right? Does it mean we are going to follow just anything? No. So we have to judge any action, any word, any deed by the word of God. And when we cannot even tell, what is inside a man's heart, that is where the Holy Spirit, by the gift of discerning of spirits, will give you a knowing. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So this is easy. Jesus himself did not come to condemn. He came to what? Save. Reconcile us. Make us right with God. So no person has the right to condemn any human being. To declare judgment Amen. upon them. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So in Romans 8, 1, it says, There is now therefore, let's go there. There is now therefore what? No condemnation. No condemnation. No condemnation. condemnation is punishment. It's judgment. No condemnation. Why? To those who are in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus, no condemnation. God is never, ever going to condemn you. Once you are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, there's no turning back. When people hear this, they say, oh, you're trying to tell people they can do anything. Blah, blah, blah. I'll say this. Those that are genuinely saved, the life of God that is in you, Zoe, the Spirit of God that is in you does not work in you to walk in sin, but it works with you to please God. Amen. And it's the Spirit that does not give up. It's the Spirit that is committed to truth, to the things of God. So that Spirit helps you to endure to the end. The only way you are going to lose your citizenship or your salvation is to deny Jesus Christ as the Savior. That is the only thing that will put you into condemnation. 
because you have chosen to condemn yourself. That's the only thing. There's nothing out there apart from this that will make you lose fellowship with Jesus Christ or lose your uh, what, membership, family membership, or your joint air kind of status with Jesus. No way. Unless you deny him as the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of the living God. That's the only thing. God in his wisdom knows that we are still work in progress. He knows that we have this flesh. And that is why he sent Jesus as an example. He was divine, yet in flesh and blood. You know, so we can realize that, oh, if he was able to do it, we can also do it. How did he do it? By keeping what? Walking the Father's love. When you walk in the Father's love, you just please him. And it's effortless. Let me put it that way. Because the grace of God enables you a divine ability on your life, in your life. It makes doing things possible. Amen. What in the natural is impossible. Amen. This eternal life is supernatural. I want us to realize that. So we should stop talking about, oh, all the time, a human, a human, we are human, we are human. You know, I'm flesh and black. You know, at times I'm weak. And the son. Jesus once was tired, he slept in the boat. But did he keep sleeping? No. Did he walk about talking about how he was stressed out? And all these people coming to him, you know, they are stressing me out. I keep preaching to the, these people and they won't listen. And I'm tired of this. I don't know why this uh, father has given this kind of business. He wasn't. We had our own business, our house shows, we are stressed out. The three people around us, thank you, come, we are stressed out. The slightest thing, we are stressed out. Because what? We are doing life by our human ability. But life is supposed to be done by the ability that God gives. It's called grace. And when I'm talking about this, I know some people have a hard time because Christians, they don't understand grace. So they are always praying for God to give them favor. But when you understand grace, you know that within grace, or grace itself, is favor. Yes. So you're highly favored. Yes. The favor of God is at work within you and upon your life. Yes. But when you don't know, you keep knocking the door. I've been asking you all these years to give me favor. And you haven't been giving me favor. No, you have favor. You just don't know you have it. Amen. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Amen. That is why I say these things, because some people don't know. As fundamental as this is, some people don't know. And some pastors are not even teaching it. You see, because they teach things like, you have to do this, you have to do that for the favor of God to come upon you. No. No. A big no. And I want to say it again because they keep saying it. Because to them, in their human whatever, it's difficult for them to have favor when you haven't done anything. <laughs> Whoever believes, you see, when you believe, you have. When you believe, you have. When you believe, you have. So you believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You have eternal life. Yeah. Within this eternal life, it's the favor of God. Yeah, yeah. The favor of God. That's why you are joint heir with Jesus. That is favor. Yeah. You are in his family. That is favor. Yeah. He is giving you power of attorney. That is favor. He doesn't do anything on this earth except through you. That is favor. You become his partner. That is favor. Yeah. That is favor. Yeah. Hallelujah. He protecting you. That is favor. Preserving your life, favor, giving a guarantee. Jesus seated at the right hand of God, according to Romans, uh, or what do you call it, Hebrews chapter 7. He's seated there, always interceding for you. That is favor. Amen. How much work did you put in for Jesus to sit there? Or how much do you pay him to intercede on your behalf daily? How much? Nothing. It's part of the gift, favor, grace Amen. of God. Amen. Grace. The angels that are at work on your behalf, how much do you pay them? Favor. Grace of God. Amen. That is the covenant that we have with God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's it. We bind ourselves too much due to ignorance. It says, for the law of the spirit of life 
in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 6.23, we, we read that for the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So when you become born again, you, are, you have nothing to do with death anymore. It says here, for the law, you come under a different law. Amen. You come under a different government. Amen. You come under a different lord. You come under a different king. Because he's taking us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his what? Dear son. Colossians 1.13. And then, when we read first uh, Peter 2, uh, he says that he's, he's moved that, uh, he's brought us into his what? Marvelous light. We are chosen. We are chosen. We are royal. We are special. That's it. Hallelujah. Are you getting something out of this? So for the spirit of the uh, for the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Do you get it? You are that free. Why? Because you chose to believe. And you have eternal life. You pass from death. You pass from condemnation toward life. God will never ever condemn you. And the judgment that we face is different from the judgment that sin has faced. Hallelujah. God holds you accountable to his word. What he said to you. But he's not condemning you toward death. You pass from death toward life. Okay. Now we are, look at the John. Chapter 6, 47. Hallelujah. Amen. Chapter 6, 47. It says, More assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has. You see, I'm reading these things to you for you to know that if you believe, you have. Oh. It's not like you are now going to look for it. Oh. You have. Amen. It's taking place. You have. Amen. It's not you are going to have. Okay. You have. Amen. It's in your possession. Okay, look at chapter 17, 2. You are going to love this. <clears throat> 17, verse 2, John. Okay, let's take it from 1 so we understand it better. So from verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. Then verse 2. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Jesus was the only one authorized to give eternal life because he has life. You can't get life through any other person. He's the only one. You see? This is beautiful. Look at chapter 5. 19. Some people don't know, so I have to give them, you know. I find that Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may what? Marvel. Marvel. Go on. Something is missing here. Okay. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life. To whom he will. Do you get it? Because he's authorized. Just as we are now authorized. Not to give life. But to present an opportunity to the unbeliever to receive life. Because he's given us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. He's given us the message of reconciliation. Go tell the people Jesus died for you. You don't have to struggle in your sins. You don't have to struggle in, under condemnation, the weight of condemnation and the weight of guilt. Jesus became the bridge so you can be reconciled to God. That's it. Amen. Stop doing your own works to reach out to God. 
or to, to come to a place where God is pleased with you, all that you need to do is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's how simple it is. First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, 11 and 12. Hallelujah. Amen. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. Amen. It's not like He's going to give to us. He's giving to us. Amen. How do we know? Because we believe. And how are we uh, so sure about this? Because He said, if you believe, you will have. And He says, this life is in His Son. Amen. This life is in His Son. Amen. Who is the Son? Jesus Christ. Verse 12. And he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So I don't walk about thinking, hmm, do I have life at all? Am I going to go to hell or go to heaven? You know, when you accept Jesus Christ from your heart, according to Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Amen. For with your heart, man believes unto what? Righteousness. Righteousness. And with your mouth, confession is made unto salvation. salvation. That's it. Amen. It's not about how kind I am towards people. And then he decides to save me. Cornelius was good. In Acts chapter 10. He was good. He was giving us. He was praying. Doing everything. Yet he wasn't saved. Right. It took Peter mm -hmm. to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. Good news. Yeah. That is where you and I will come. Yeah. We are to preach the good news. Mm -hmm. And we should stop this move of what? Condemnation. Right. Because we will not be giving the ministry of condemnation. Right. We are able ministers of the new covenant. Mm -hmm. It says go into the world and preach Condemnation? No. no. Go into the world. Tell them what I've done. I've died for them. Now, this eternal life is a huge thing. And my time doesn't permit me to go into that. So, I would I will continue another day. But the eternal life is not just, like I said, your sins are forgiven. And uh, when you die, you're going to make it to heaven. And that's it. Eternal life brings you to a place where normal life should not be normal. Amen. I want to say that again. <laughs> Eternal life, when you become aware of it, life should not be normal. Amen. Your life should be supernatural. Amen. There was something about Jesus. Amen. They said, this guy is different. Amen. The Pharisees themselves, they could tell. The Sadducees could tell. Whoever was listening to Jesus, they said, this guy is not like the Pharisees. He carries authority. He's different. Yes. And then they saw the same thing with the disciples, the students, the followers, those that he taught. They look at them, they realize that they were unlearned guys. But they said, These guys, these guys, they've been with Jesus. Right. Why? Because Jesus taught them, he woke them up to the reality of God, the person of God, the nature of God, the Holy Spirit that is within them. And how they can do the same thing that he was doing. And they started doing that. Hallelujah. Amen. No child of God should walk around and be like they are hopeless and they are helpless. Amen. We are agents of change and transformation. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. People don't even know this Holy Spirit that is within them. He's called the helper. He's a help that God has placed on our inside. Some have GPS in their navigation system. And some who don't have it because it, is a, it wasn't factory done or whatever, manufactured with a car, whatever. They go into stores and they buy this system, GPS, and they put it in their cars. Why? Because they've seen what? The benefits of having a GPS in your car. The Holy Spirit is God's GPS. The Holy Spirit, He works with the Word of God. Amen. You are not ordinary. Amen. You are supernatural. 
You have your divine aspect. And you have to tap into that divine nature that you have. Amen. That is created after God Amen. in righteousness. Amen. That is a can do kind of side of you. Amen. When he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So in, the, in, in, in this, hallelujah. Amen. You see, oh God, give me strength. Oh God, strengthen me. No. He's already there strengthening you. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Let me find, um, let me say it in another way. Just ask all the time. God makes oxygen available for you to breathe. If somebody can't take that in, it's their problem. It's not like, you know, God stop releasing, supplying oxygen. But somebody gets somewhere, for some reason, they are not able to take in oxygen. And then they need even medical or scientific what kind of help. So God keeps supplying what? Oxygen. In the same way, every day you are being strengthened by the Holy Ghost who indwells you. Amen. Why does He keep strengthening you? It's part of the grace of God that is within you. The grace of God brings you to a place where you desire, you are willing to do what is pleasing in His sight. Amen. That is it. And He empowers you to do that. Amen. For it is Him who is at work in you, both to what? Will and to do of His good pleasure. That's Philippians 2.13. Yeah. And then Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things Amen. through Christ who strengthens. He's there strengthening to pray. God give me strength. God, no, you are lying to yourself. Yeah. You have to wake up and say, I have strength. That's why I'm going to go forward. Amen. Amen. When David faced Goliath, it wasn't like, you guys, wait, let me go and fast one day. Goliath, you stay here. Please, people, beg Goliath. Let him stay here. Let me go back and fast for a day and I'm going to come back. Goliath, you stay here. I'm just going to kneel there and pray and come back. No! No! He had the word in him. He had the word in him. He was aware of his covenant with God. Amen. That's why I said, you come to me this way, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. He was aware of his covenant. What he was carrying. And when we are aware of it, we are not just going to stand there and take no for an answer. We are not going to stand around and somebody just abuse us or say all kinds of things. You see, we have to know that we are people of authority. And our word carries power and carry authority. We have to shift atmospheres by what? Our presence shift atmospheres by just our word. Shift atmospheres when we are just looking. Because, you see, it's not coming from us. It's coming through us. It comes from God, but through us. We have to say yes. So it can come through what? Us. Amen. If we don't say yes, it can come through us. We have to say yes. Peter all the time could make the cripple walk. Can raise drunk as who was dead. But he didn't know because he didn't say yes. He kept denying Jesus. And as he denied Jesus, couldn't do anything. So he came to a place where he said yes to the word of God. We have to say yes to what God is saying. Hallelujah. Amen. And then we are going to see. That's how simple it is. We have to say yes. yes Lord. The power is not ours. The authority is not ours. We are like pipelines. We are vessels of honor. We are channels. Amen. Hallelujah. We are agents. Amen. Our authority comes from him, Amen. from above. And Jesus said that. He said, I don't do anything by my own authority. Amen. He was aware of the Father's authority. Amen. That is what was working in. We must be aware of the same. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. For instance, I thank you. We we pray and pray, and then we throw the name. And when we finish, like, ah, 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 in the name of Jesus. Do we even know what we are saying? In the name of Jesus, it becomes like a cliche. No, for you, the believer, when you say in the name of Jesus, you should know that the whole heavens, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the angels. Everybody that stands with God, they are backing you Amen. to make what you are saying yeah. come to pass. Yeah. That is why we don't slap anything we say with the name of Jesus. It must be something that God has already authorized, has sanctioned, yeah. has willed, has ordained. Yeah. And then you know it. The counsel of God. You have the counsel of God. You come into agreement. You release it. You say it. Yeah. But not just this, this kind of... Uh, so called whatever people are trying to do, like a show performance. I declare and decree. In the name of Jesus, I declare and decree. The name of Jesus, I declare and decree. And they, they sound good. Now, when we declare and decree, we should see things happen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 
That's what I'm talking about. This just wasn't going about the grind, the grind, the No. When Jesus spoke, it happened. He was in agreement. He was aware of his union with God, his oneness. He said, what I see the Father do, that is what I do. Hallelujah. Let me close by this. Because I'm saying it, somebody hasn't seen it. Go to John chapter 8, verses um, 28 and 29. John 8, 28. Hallelujah. Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am well, He, and that I do nothing. I do nothing. I do nothing of myself. I do nothing. Now, believers are practicing witchcraft, and they don't even know it. And they are practicing witchcraft towards even God. They are imposing their will on God. Can you imagine that? And they think shouting instructions to God, God make this happen. God do this, God do that. No, God, you are wasting your time. God is moved by his word. And until you speak his word, the angels will be standing on their guard. They are watching you. Because they should respond only to the word of God. The only person they recognize is God. The only thing they recognize is the word. Who is Jesus? And that's why they recognize you. Because when you come under the umbrella of Jesus, you see, when you become, you become born again, you have this robe of righteousness. God looks at you through the eyes of Jesus, through the person of Jesus. So everything has to be Jesus. The word Jesus, the word Jesus, Jesus, who is the word Jesus, who is the word? And then so far as you are doing that, the angels, they are at your beck and call. Everything you say, they back it. Everything you do, they are into it. That's why we have to know the word. Amen. We have to say the word. Jesus didn't struggle. The apostles, the same. They prayed. Even when they prayed, it was shaking. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't do anything of my own soul. But I ask my father, talk to me. That's important. As my father taught me. Christians, some of them say this. Oh, this thing about the will of God, we don't have to worry about the will of God. Then we are under grace and sensation. I believe in grace. All right? Yeah. We are under grace. So you, have, you, have, you only do and ask the Father to bless it. No, 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 no. First, know what He wants you to do. And then you don't even have to ask Him to bless it. Because whatever He tells you to do, yeah. and whatever He wants you to do, it is already blessed. Yeah. Yeah. He has His approval on it. Hallelujah. As he has taught me, I speak these things. 29. You love this. And he who sent me is with me. You see the awareness I was talking about? He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. For I always do, do those things that please him. Christians, you go through. Probably, somehow, your picture didn't come through. Then you say, Father, why have you but That day, the prayer that people pray is different. They will kneel and cry. They will shed some tears before God. Hey, God, the way I've been serving you, and this time, this week, I don't know why, but my picture didn't come through. <laughs> <laughs> and then the same one will say, I know that the Holy Spirit endorsed me. You know, the Father and I, we are one. What is happening now? Do we just say it for saying sake? Or we really believe it? We really know it? You see, God doesn't have many vacation homes. doesn't have one in Florida. So at times, <laughs> you are looking for him, can't get him, don't get him. He has to call his number, you know, in Florida. No, 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 no. He's within you. And I'll say this. Never expect to hear the audible voice of God. He's within you, so He speaks within you. Amen. People have been what? Misled. They always say, oh, somebody said, God spoke to you and said, oh, you heard this audible voice. What, what do you care? Audible voice. Then what, is, what, what is that going to do to you? Okay. The main thing is to hear. <laughs> the main thing is to hear His voice, to know that this is His voice. Amen. He speaks within you because He indwells you. Amen. You have become His tabernacle. 
you are his dwelling place. He's not outside. Hallelujah. That does it for tonight.